one's first thought is of troops crossing the desert or of supplies being sent to the front. But the pipelines tell us we're in oil country. The month is September. This is one of the drilling crews belonging to an outpost far off in the northeast, the Great Northern Desert, as the Chinese call it. The territory is about the size of North Dakota. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Crew 1205 is being relieved by the next shift. The area is so vast that no camera can capture where people have come from and where they're going to. All roads seem to disappear into the horizon. for me? Here are the magazines. It's from the brigade leader. His sister has to go back right away. Yeah. 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 
Any letters to mail? I'm just getting used to the climate here and the living conditions. There's not much oil or mud where I come from. Here there's too much oil, too much mud. I didn't like it at first. Even when it's raining hard, the workers really stick to it. Once the drill is on, there's no stopping it. We had a lot of trouble learning how to run it. We didn't know anything about drilling. It took a lot of effort on our part and help from the experienced workers. Do you like your work? Yes, we're proud of it. But it involves a lot of responsibility, too. When you go home, do you stay for a long time? 40, 50 days? After your vacation, is it hard to come back? It's always a little sad. We only go home once a year. It's a long wait. We don't see our family or friends for a whole year. We'd like to stay with them longer, even just an hour. We don't want to leave them. But when we think of our work here, of the crew and the drilling, well, it doesn't take us long to come back. When all this keeps going through your head, you feel like you'll never work things out. But when you think about the revolution, then everything becomes simple. I left my family when I was 15, in 1970. When I went to sign up for this job, they asked me how old I was. They said I was too young. I told them, maybe I am, but I want to go as much as the others do. <coughs> so they gave me a form to fill out, and I waited at home for an answer. But it didn't come. I was worried. The others were going to leave in two weeks. So I wrote to say that I wanted to go no matter what. I hadn't told my family yet. When I asked my mother if I could go to Taqing, she said, go wherever you want. She didn't really believe me. Do you mean that? I asked her. Actually, it took a lot of persuasion before she gave in. 
Finally, she agreed and bought me everything I needed. When I got to Taqing, I saw there was only empty space, just the prairie. Not even any buildings. In winter, it's so cold that my quilted clothes weren't warm enough. When I saw what it was like, I almost changed my mind. But when I remembered my insistence on coming here, I got my courage back. When my wife was about to deliver, I got permission to go home. At the end of my leave, I hesitated to return to Taqing. It was the turning point of my life. After thinking about it, I remembered how important the oil wells were, and I went back. <laughs> Selfishness was part of the old society, and you can't get rid of it just like that. Do you sometimes think about social position, a good job, an easier life? Sometimes, yes. As time goes on, and we get older, lots of problems come up. Love, marriage, children, and so on. Sometimes we think about promotions and higher wages. Yes, we think about that a lot. We have to fight to get rid of these ideas. What did you do during the Cultural Revolution? <laughs> I was only so big. I followed the grown-ups. I shouted the same slogans. And when they covered the walls with political posters, I carried the glue. I was working with Crew 1205 at the time. I didn't know anything about politics. All I thought about was eating lunch at home, then going to the wells, checking out the drill and the other equipment. I was confused about the political struggle. Before, we were told, do your job and don't worry about politics. That was a good way of preventing us from understanding capitalism. But I learned all this in the Cultural Revolution. The men bring the derrick in, they drill, then they move the whole platform 1,200 feet further and start all over again. When the drilling site is too far away, the whole encampment is moved along with it. Four crews, each one works eight hours and rests for 24 hours.
Many young people from all over the country come to work in Duching for two or three years and then leave. For all of China, Duching represents much more than oil. It serves as a model that young people can put into practice elsewhere. This is where communication, administration, and production management are based for an important part of the oil industry. It's called oil headquarters. A typist must be highly skilled to work with a typewriter that has 2,000 characters. At oil headquarters, the workers, technicians, and cadres plan the next drilling sites. Experience shows us the importance of economic independence. The oil problem seems economic, but it's really political. Oil has made us politically independent. When our country needed oil, the Soviet imperialists tried to humiliate and strangle us. So they decided to cut off our oil supplies and call back their technicians. The Soviets have a talent for deception. They pretend to offer economic aid, but there are always political strings attached. When we needed lubricants for the machinery, they didn't dare say no, but they put us in a critical situation. It was very bad. In the summer, they delivered oil for the winter, and in the winter, oil for the summer. That's right, oil for the summer. In the winter, it froze, and in the summer, it burned. The machinery was damaged because of the lubricants they gave us. Those Soviets planned it that way. You don't have any oil? Here's some, but one condition. Be our satellite. Our living conditions were very hard, too. So many people came to these barren, uninhabited plains that they had to live in shacks or in tents, even in caves. Yes, caves. We had a lot of problems. In 1960, the weather conditions were very bad, and food had to be rationed. 
No matter what your job was, both day and night, you had to give a lot of yourself in order to speed up the drilling and to help build socialism. The important things about our battle are its political nature and the spirit of our fighters. For 13 years, we've been producing oil to build our country and for the revolution. We also produce enough to export. The refinery here provides Daqing with the oil it needs, but most of the crude oil is refined elsewhere. These trains are called petroleum dragons. Water supply, power hookups, tanks, pumping stations. Everything follows the drilling crews. In the 1960s, discovering oil was necessary for China's independence. Since that time, Daxing has been thought of as a kind of battleground. Military language is used everywhere. Da Qing was established in 1960. The first pioneers found only the barren prairie. In winter, the temperatures dropped to 20, even 40 below zero. The short summer is a bright change from the months of ice and gray skies. The wind of the Great Plains blows all year long. In America, the West was one with killing, plunder, and greed. The general law was every man for himself. Dutching has chosen an entirely different approach. Dutching is a collective effort governed by the law of the people. As in all conquests, Dutching has its heroes. Mama Sue is known all over China. I came to Taqing in 1961. The Great Plains seemed to go on forever. I got the idea that the housewives could organize themselves to clear the land. So we went from door to door, asking who wants to take part in the work and who doesn't. If the women answered no, we'd have political discussions with them to get them to participate in clearing and farming the land. At first, 25 women signed up, but the day we planned to leave, only five showed up. 
As for the others, well, one had a child, another a sick relative. It was impossible to get them to come. And what could five of us do? I said, nobody's ever gone out there. Let's go and see for ourselves. The others can come later. There was nothing alive out there. Not a living thing. The grass came up to our waists. There wasn't even a path. As we walked along, we had to wade through the tall grass. Where could we camp? We set up a simple tent with stakes at the four corners. Once the tent was up, we dug a ditch and built a dirt wall around it. Yes, we built a dirt wall. As for the children, the mother said, we've been running all afternoon, now we're exhausted. There are wolves out here. If they come out at night, they might carry off our children. The tent didn't have a door, so at night, we stuck our shovels in the ground to bar the entrance. While the others slept, I looked around outside every now and then. Nothing ever happened. The next day, we started shoveling. After having cleared an acre of land, General Headquarters sent news that they had mobilized some more women, and 18 more housewives arrived. That made 23 women in all, but it was late in the season, and shoveling went too slowly. We found a wooden plow and pulled it by hand. The work went faster that way. One of us guided the plow, and nine others pulled it. The others continued shoveling. Pulling the plow that way was exhausting. Before we'd cross the field, our legs would buckle under us, and we'd fall on our knees. In 1962, we harvested over 3,000 pounds of soybeans and more than 40,000 pounds of vegetables. We only had five shovels to work with. In 1963, there were more of us, and we were able to farm more land. Little by little, our village is growing. That's the story of our village. I'm finished. I wanted to ask her, is she proud of what she's done? Of her success, is she proud of the way she organized the other women? <laughs> I worked according to Chairman Mao's teachings. I still have a ways to go. I'm far from being satisfied. Take it apart. It's clogged. We can take this off, too. There's nothing there. No, nothing. Why doesn't it work, then? It seems all right. Dashing has none of the capitalist greed usually associated with black gold. Here, they don't want to destroy nature by taking the oil and leaving the land to be reclaimed by the wind and the desert. They are not only developing the oil industry, they are also creating an entire social community which will continue to function after the oil is gone. The several hundred thousand people who have come to Dashing want to eliminate the traditional divisions between agriculture and industry, between the country and the city. We've organized a new kind of industrial and agricultural cooperative. 
It includes both the city and the countryside. So we live here, and we work here. We do the job of farming for the drilling crews, and this helps the workers build the oil industry. By growing vegetables for the workers, we help develop the oil fields in our own way. Altogether, there are 16 city-country cooperatives like ours. When we weren't working, we never went out. The only important things were our houses, our husbands, and our children. In a large city, or if we weren't working, we'd just stay home and fuss over our children or walk around in the streets from store to store. We'd only be consumers. Before we started working, our husbands used to say, at work, the Eastern Revolutionary wind blows, but at home, it's the Western materialist wind. At work, they talk to us about politics, machines, and oil, but as soon as we get home, our wives talk about sheets, clothing, or somebody's husband who makes so much money, or who says such and such a thing, you know, gossip. Now they say, our wives work like everybody else. At work, the eastern wind blows, and we think of the revolution. And now when we get home, the east wind is still blowing. Now we're economically independent. It's not like before, when we had to beg our husbands for every penny, or ask their permission to buy something. In other words, our work reinforces our political ideas and frees us economically. Before, if our children asked us for money, we had to ask our husbands. Now that we earn our own living, we can give them money ourselves. We're glad to live in this new kind of village. Liu Xiaoqi wanted to construct tall buildings here. We wondered if we'd get used to them. Our adobe houses are simple and practical. We're cool in summer and warm in the winter. The tall buildings that Liu Xiaoqi proposed were not practical, especially because we'd have to climb all the stairs. We're happy here in our village. Here, instead of destroying nature, man invests in it. Small towns have been built every 15 or 20 miles. Each town is surrounded by four or five villages. When we ask the people who live here who they are, they answer, neither workers nor peasants, neither city nor country people, a little of each. Every small town and its villages forms a complete social unit, supplying all the necessary services, including radio and weather stations and small factories. The gas they get from the oil wells supplies them with free energy for all their daily needs. In the winter, we heat the walls. When they're heated, all the rooms, large and small, are warm. In winter, it's used both for heating and cooking in the kitchen. 
On top and on the bottom. Every two months, a team of seamstresses arrives to help the workers repair their clothing. Could you fix this shoe for me? Here. Here's the hole. I'm bringing you some clothing. In 1960, when we decided to drill for oil, a large number of people came to Daqing. When they got here, the men were dressed in ragged clothes. First we took these rags apart and washed them. Then we repaired them. And then we sent them to the sewing workshop where they were turned into quilted clothing. Two old sets made one new one. 
Do you see this piece? We use it to make a large patch. And this little one for a small hole. When the patches are very small, and when there's something that needs patching, for example, this one, you see, we put this small piece of material over this tiny hole. Then we'll sew it by machine with strong thread. Everything will be used, whether it's large or small. We don't throw anything out. We're making the revolution and we're economizing. That's what we're proud of. According to metaphysics, material objects are unchangeable. But Chairman Mao's philosophy has taught us that things can be transformed into their opposites. That's how rags are turned into cotton. You discover truth by putting ideas into practice. We started out with the idea that cloth was made of cotton. Then we asked, if cotton can be transformed into cloth, why can't cloth be turned into cotton again? Practical experience proved that it was possible. When we tried to find a way to do this, we sometimes got discouraged. But finally, we succeeded in making cotton from cloth. We were really excited. At first, our experiments didn't work. But we thought that since these rags were made of cotton fiber, there must be a way to make cotton again from the rags. It's a dialectical process. We tried seven times before we finally got it. Since 1970, we've made 300,000 pairs of gloves with only 90,000 pounds of recycled cotton. Our interest in philosophy keeps growing because we can apply it to concrete situations. It's fascinating and it encourages us to study philosophy. Some rags are made into gloves. Other rags that are patched together in our sewing workshop are made into clothing for the workers. We make quilted overcoats and knee pads because the workers told us that the ones who work in the fields often get rheumatism in their knees. Lenin said that socialism is when even a simple cook is concerned with affairs of state. It is also when seamstresses study philosophy. The Office of Geological Research is located right on the oil field. Up until the 1950s, geologists from the imperialist countries claimed that China had very few oil resources. Their main point was that China was made up of land sediments instead of marine sediments. We weren't taken in by this. Chairman Mao has explained in his article on practice that in order to see if a theory is correct, you must put it into practice. <coughs> we found oil in Daqing, quite a lot of oil, in the sandy clay layers. When you talk about land and marine sediments, you're only looking at things superficially. You need to look more deeply to understand how oil is formed. For the past 13 years, the women workers at well number 17 have gone beyond the quota set by the state. We introduced water into the injection well, which pushes the oil through into the main well. The amount of oil we get depends on how much water we inject. The oil and the water are opposites, but here they work together. 
By applying Engel's theory, we can call the different layers of oil the internal cause and the injection of water the external cause. We've changed the method of water injection, the external cause, so that it can function better with the internal cause. Since 1960, we've been using a system that consists of injecting water and extracting oil layer by layer. This is an example of how studying philosophy can help solve a concrete problem. When water is injected into the underground layers, it collects in the lower layers because it's heavier than oil. So it pushes the oil up toward the surface. The principle is simple, but there are many different methods. In this particular field of oil technology, the pioneers of Daqing are 10 years ahead of the rest of the world. Western scientists must go through the same process we do. That is, an experiment, a failure. Another experiment until finally the solution is found. In scientific experiments, you must be guided by the right theory. Then you can analyze your failures and reach your goals. Otherwise, you have many more failures and it will take longer before you succeed. Some people say that here you can't choose your job, that all jobs are assigned by the administration. What do you think? We should talk about freedom in the West. People there can't even choose their work. And you call that freedom? Let's compare a Western worker and a Chinese worker. I'm a driller. What freedom does a Western worker have compared to me? He has the freedom to be unemployed, or at least the freedom to worry about it. According to newspapers and radio, American, English, and French workers are always threatened by unemployment. And then they strike, and what for? Just to have work. Ask Western workers if they can participate as equals in discussions with the engineers. In China, the workers have mastered scientific concepts as well as the oil fields. The projects are planned on the work site with the workers, the engineers, and the managers. Our drilling crew knows the most about our well and how it works. We're not just robots, we run the wells. That's why we know all about them. In our work, we solve problems based on our experience. The division of labor between those who make the decisions and those who carry them out is a method to exploit and oppress the workers. Our collective work gives us workers access to scientific knowledge. In this way, we lessen the educational differences and bring workers and professionals closer together. Scientific and technical knowledge is universal by nature, but it serves the interests of the class in power. If the bourgeoisie has this knowledge, then the bourgeoisie profits from it. If the working class controls it, it serves its interests. The people you work for and with in scientific research, that's the difference between socialism and capitalism. Our struggle is not just for oil, it's for our dignity too, for our political ideals, and for the dignity of the Chinese people. To build that Qing, we didn't count on help from the heavens, but on Chairman Mao's philosophy and the workers' determination. That's how we built wells where there was nothing. And as the wells evolve, so does man, and vice versa. For the past 13 years, the revolution has been changing each person. On May 1st, 1960, the first pioneers arrived at Daqing. They came from all over China. Even before they built shelters, they studied two philosophical works by Mao Zedong, On Practice and On Contradiction. In this northern desert, all they could count on was human courage and strong will. 
Faced with this struggle, they had to be united. United around a common idea. From the very beginning, there were great political battles. Liao Chao Chi, then president of the Republic, was against the Da Qing experiment and wanted to abandon it. He thought it was badly organized and poorly timed. He wanted to buy the oil abroad. On the contrary, Mao Zedong believed that the Chinese had to rely on their own strengths, be independent, and trust the new ideas coming from the workers. This pioneer, who's no longer alive, was called the Man of Iron. Along with Mama Sui, he was one of the great heroes of Da Qing. The year 1960 was extremely difficult for China. The Russians had just cut off their aid, including aid to the oil industry. The Americans continued their economic boycott. Natural disasters ruined the crops. And yet, Da Qing and the revolution succeeded. It has become a model for all of China, an example of how to build both industry and socialism together. When the drillers are working on the frontline drills, they can't come home every night. But we get along all right. Before, when we weren't organized to work, we used to live out in the oil fields with our husbands in makeshift houses. And we'd move along with the crew. Now we live in peasant worker villages. Our husbands work in peace. When Da Qing started out, there were lots of workers and their families, and not much housing. So there was this contradiction between a lot of people and very little housing. How could we solve this problem? If we only counted on the men, the construction would have been too slow. To deal with the situation as fast as possible, we decided to take things into our own hands. But there were prejudices to overcome from the men and also from some of the women. They thought that even though we were able to do farm work, we still wouldn't be able to do construction work. It wasn't just the men who didn't have confidence in us. We underestimated ourselves, too. Women can farm the land with hoes, but build houses, climb ladders with a load of plaster. And what if we fell from so high up? We were afraid, but we practiced. We carried empty buckets up to the roof. Old prejudices, yes, ideas from the old society haven't completely disappeared. Some people still think that way. For example, that women aren't able to build houses, that they should take care of the children and the cooking, that they shouldn't worry about anything else. These ideas still exist. They haven't completely disappeared. Men have two hands to contribute to the socialist revolution. Well, so do we. We can do as much. We must carry on the revolution, like the men. 
We like living here as a group. We can do lots of things. Ever since the women got together, we all help each other out. For example, we take care of women who've just had babies and sick children. We help each other out. Before, we were isolated in our families. If something happened, for example, if someone got sick, we couldn't count on anybody for help. Now that we live collectively, our lives have changed. When someone gets sick, the others help. They get the doctor to come treat the sick person. It's a good thing. Before, it was each family for itself. But living collectively doesn't mean we don't have family life. Each family decides for itself who does the errands or how to furnish the house. At the beginning, we weren't used to collective life, but now we're getting used to it. If we left the collective way to go back to the old family life, or... No, we've really gotten used to it. I think that in the West, with a little practice, most people there could get used to it, too. In political struggles and in the revolution, they too would organize themselves and form collective groups. mail services, the seamstresses, the traveling markets, all of Daqing supports the drillers out in the oil fields. There are two different kinds of pioneers and two different legends. One is the lone cowboy from the American Far West who has to rely on his own fast reflexes to survive. The other is the oil driller from Daqing, a worker who belongs to a socialist society. His strength is that of the entire group.
I'd like this style. <laughs> Whose turn is it? A little longer than that. Teams from oil headquarters are using cement to strengthen the wells that were opened by the first drilling crews. Winter is coming. A new front line must be set up and drilled as quickly as possible. Da Qing holds the celebration in its own honor. It's an ancient custom to parade those who are to be honored on horseback. They're not celebrating the achievements of technology, but rather the spirit of Da Qing. These socialist pioneers, the heroes, all 3,600 of them, are not workers who have produced the most or stood at their machines the longest. 
They are being honored because they represent the power of a revolutionary people. I wish all my comrades the best of health. The speaker is Yuki Hong, representing the young progressive workers. Let's give her a hand. Cadres and fellow workers, after I finished high school, I answered Chairman Mao's calls to young people to unite with the workers, peasants, and soldiers. The party committee and the cadres of Da Qing are helping us in our political studies. They are also patiently teaching us the necessary skills. In this way, we've learned things that we couldn't have learned in books or in the classroom. During this new battle, we've gotten a new revolutionary spirit from the young people, the spirit of daring to think and daring to act. And we in turn have taught them the tradition of struggle and the spirit of the man of iron. In this way, they will always be with us in the oil fields. And Da Qing, like the red flag, will lead the forward march of Chairman Mao's revolution.
We must have a special concern for the crews that work in the most distant oil fields. We must help them with the problems of daily life. The harder they struggle, the more we must worry about their well-being. Keep up their revolutionary spirit. We must unite to win even greater victories. Follow the example of the man of iron. Follow the example of Dai Chai. Singing and dancing to tell the story of their lives and struggles is a popular Chinese tradition. Since the 1930s and the Revolutionary War, the communists have followed this tradition. flags of Da Qing are waving in the wind. Listen to the victorious song of the battle for oil. We offer the fruits of our victory to the party. Continue to criticize revisionism and to study Marx, Lenin, and Chairman Mao. We overflow with enthusiasm for our work. The number five drilling crew has set the example. It has drilled ten wells. The news of the drilling crew's victories resounds everywhere. By the end of July, 321 wells dug. By the end of July, 319 in operation. Teams 1205 and 1202 drilled 30,000 feet in June. Team 1274's small pump has surpassed the large one. In June, the Derrick team changed drilling sites in 5 hours and 10 minutes. Flowers are blooming. Red flags are flying. Victories come one after another. We are the drillers. Our enthusiasm is like an erupting volcano. Our ambition is greater than the sea. Speed up the drilling. We'll make a rainbow. The oil dragon will reach the sky. Follow Chairman Mao's example. Forward to battle.